Mike Shepard, it's really uh, a pleasure of mine to have you on this video chat talking about video games. This is the first in a series that I'm going to do where I interview players about why they play, what they play, what affects them uh, the most in their playing of games, and uh, some things that I might be familiar with, but other things I might be totally foreign to as an aspiring developer. So welcome, Mike. Thank you. I love that I'm the first. Um, because I've been watching your series, so now I have nothing to go off of because it's usually, you know, you're just, you and Lammy are talking. So this is the first time to kind of experience a new person. I get to be the guinea pig. I love it. That's great. Let's do this. Do you, are you used to being a guinea pig in your life, do you think? All the time. All the time. Are you kidding? Like, that's, <laughs> I ran, I ran a youth theater company in a small sort of mid-sized city in Ontario and I was the guinea pig for everything. You know, oh, the first person to do a show at this big theater with, with, that we just renovated and, and you're probably going to lose a lot of money. Oh, I'll let Mike Shepard do it. He'll, he'll, he'll be our guinea pig. We'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, we'll, we'll be kind to the guinea pig in this episode. Um, my, my questions are, uh, are, are nice and positive, but... You know, we'll see. Maybe we'll have some tougher ones, some curveballs thrown at you, just to see what happens. I hope so. I want I want to have at least one curveball in this conversation where I just have to stammer out a half answer. That's my goal. <laughs> well, I can always edit that out or keep it in. I guess depending on my mood. Yeah, that's true. Depending how how kind you want to be that day. So, Mike, uh, what kind of games do you play? Well, I have been playing sports games since. I can remember. Since I can remember picking up a gaming console on original Nintendo, I have been playing hockey games, basketball, football, baseball, um, really any sport, regardless of if I was interested in it or not. I would be playing sports games like from day one, like six, seven years old, up until still today at 35, I go to a sport game over anything else. I branched out a little bit especially in the past five years where I've done a little bit of different gaming. Um, I'm a big fan of fantasy, sci-fi, so I've tried some of those games. But if I'm going to like say I'm a certain type of gamer, it's sports games because I, I know them the best. I love playing them. I think they're so incredible. They've taught me things, which is kind of a weird thing to say, but is very true. They've taught me a lot in my life that's actually helped me in my career. So sports games would be the type of game that I would say that that I play that I feel like I'm a master at or or someone who's trying to be a master. That's great. There's actually one of my questions is about do, do games teach you anything? But before we get there, um, one of the earliest games I remember playing, and I think it was on Nintendo, regular Nintendo, NES, was Super V-Ball. V is in volleyball. And uh, my cousin and I played it. We lived in Ottawa at the time, and we would just play hours and hours. And we would, you know, every time you spiked the ball, it looked like a football smashing into the sand. And you could hit the other players and send them falling off into the ground. And, you know, my memories are much more visceral and visual than the game probably has any right to claim. Uh, given that this was a Nintendo game, but I just have this really powerful memory of it. For for you, what's the earliest game you can remember playing? Yeah, it's called Ice Hockey. So it, that's literally this is what it's called, Ice Hockey, but it was an international hockey game for original Nintendo. Like, this is for the Nintendo. And it was, you had three, you basically built a team out of these three avatars that you had to choose from. One was really tall and skinny. One was like kind of medium size and one was super fat, like really short and fat. And the skinny tall one was like really, really fast. The middle one could shoot really, really well. But the big one was how you just crush other people. He was really slow, but you could crush. And you'd have to choose how many of the five players do I want to be tall and skinny, medium, or extremely fat and short. So that was the first game I remember ever playing. Canada was in the game. Like you had all these different countries. Canada was green for some reason. Like they, they were they were all in green, which doesn't make any sense, but that's what they were. And you would basically just play and you would move, as you move your avatar around, the whole team would move with you. 
because there w- it wasn't so advanced that you're switching between individual players. If you were the center, you won the faceoff, you had the puck, all your players are kind of moving bes- behind you at about the same rate that you're moving. So if you want to make a pass, they're kind of there. And then as a group, they would move down the other way. Um, that was the first game I can remember playing. I remember playing with my brother, my dad, for hours and hours and hours playing this ice hockey game for original Nintendo. Like little, you, you could still see the pixel. I can see the pixels. Like it was so pixelated because because it's so old, but we would play hours and hours of this game. It was wild. Yeah, that's fascinating. It sounds like a fun game. I remember playing uh, a hockey game. It might have been on Sega Genesis or TurboGrafx-16, one of these consoles. And uh, it was pretty basic, but like addictive, like just getting into the, the core game loop of of you know scoring goals and defending. And uh, I haven't played a lot of sports games, but the ones I have played... It almost seems like it's too easy to become a god on the ice or on the field. Like, you're just automatically this amazing, and you haven't done all the work that the athlete has to get to that place. Um, But, you know, from my understanding, today sports games are a lot more complex than just handling a player on the ice uh, or or being one of the athletes. There's a management side to it. So what, talking about sports games, the games that you're playing today, specifically what are the games, what are they called, and what are... What is the core gameplay loop? Are, are you actually playing the sport or are you managing the team? How does that work? Well, it's up to you. That's the thing. Like the games now for sports games have so many just game modes. You can be an individual player and go through all the the things that they would have to go through. Drafting, getting drafted into the league, um, issues of who to trust with your money, uh, signing contracts, and then playing the game. You can be the player, the individual player. You can just play old school mode and play a game and just see what happens and just play the game. Or you can be a, like you're alluding to, a general manager or a manager or a coach where you control every aspect of your team. And that is what I'm addicted to. That is the thing that I'll say I love about gaming, that I'm into, that I play constantly. I always go through the cycle of, okay, it's now time to sit down for three or four months and play out a career. Um, on the management side, you're you're controlling everything from the budget of the team, where you're allocating funds, how much you're paying players, signing them to contracts for the next couple of years. You yourself now are signed on to a contract. You'll get a two or three year deal to start. And at the end of each season, you get kind of an assessment. What did you fail what did you uh, achieve? What do we want to see out of you next year in order for you to earn your next contract? So you can control every aspect down to being the president of the team and moving a franchise that is real, that exists from one city to another and picking up and starting all over and building your own arena and deciding how much money to spend, what the construction's going to look like, everything. So the control you have now is incredible because you basically can be an armchair GM, which is in sports, that's what they call people like me who sit on their couch watching hockey or football or something and yelling at the screen being like, what are you doing? Like, like, I I would trade you. You can now do that in game form, thinking that you know uh, as much as these professionals get paid millions of dollars. You can do that with the gaming system now. So when we first chatted about the games that you play months ago, I went and got a game called, it was on a, an incredible sale, uh, Franchise Hockey Manager 8. Okay. Okay, so I don't, I, don't know, I don't know if this is the kind of game that you're talking, I think it's the kind of game you're talking about, I don't know if it's specifically one that you play, but I, it, took for, it was a huge game, partly because it had all of the information, all of the statistics for all of the players in multiple leagues around the world and the the immense amount of activity and agency you have to create a team, run a team, manage a career. You have an email inbox in this game where you have to sign a deal or take a job or move to a different city or make a trade, whatever, was overwhelming for me because I'm not uh, the avid sports fan that you are. So I'm like, I don't know any of these people and who they are. There was no easy way in, but I could easily see how this would be applicable to so many sports fans whose pleasure is to get together on a Friday night with their friends and just chat about what they would do differently, um, which is such a pastime in sports, but clearly this has been activated in a game. So it, is that one of the games, or am I, am I close here to the kind of things you're playing? That would be the type of game. Um, in terms of the simulation 
of sports games, the the people that do it the best is EA. EA Sports and everything they've put together, it, they do it the best. So what you're talking about is kind of like a, you know another group trying to do something similar. The difference, I think, from what I can from what I can tell, is that EA they've got the franchise mode. That's what you can do. That's a that's an option. That's what they call it. But you don't have to just do that. Not everybody has, I think, that part of their brain that gets really, really stimulated by that. Because you describing everything that you're talking about makes me excited, right? Like I'm I'm energized and ready to do those things and to take on that responsibility. Some people want to just play the game. And that's why they have different modes now in EA. There's franchise, which is kind of what we're talking about, which the game you grabbed would be exactly what I'm doing. Now, the difference is, I think, I also can, I also play. So I can play as the team after making all these decisions and play through an entire season. I can do anything that I want. I can play and have the real hockey mode with all the changes that I've made to the team, but I'm just acting as the owner and I have all this control over um, what what the team's doing. Maybe even more control than really what an owner or a general manager has now. And EA has done a really good job of saying, yes, here's the franchise mode. If you're, if you're like me, you're going to love it. Here's the be a pro mode where you're just one player. And you have to go through and live the day in the life of that player. Then there's just regular game modes, tournaments and regular games and shootouts and all these different things for skills competitions that you want to just practice and actually play and physically be be playing the sport. So what you're talking about is definitely the type of thing that I loved, if not specifically that game, but that has really captured me in terms of sports games. There's nothing better than saying, okay, I am now the general manager of my beloved Toronto Maple Leafs, and I'm going to finally win them a Stanley Cup and trying to go through that process. There's nothing better than, than that for me. So when these games have imported this gargantuan amount of sports data on every player, every team, over years and years and years around the world, do you think that that makes the game you know, obviously not fully accurate, but a somewhat good representation of how a sports season will actually play out? Or is it is it quite a bit off and more for the player to just enjoy it in the fantasy sense? No, I think it is pretty accurate. I mean, they, they do a very good job of timelining out your year. When you create a franchise, you can begin at any time point you want. But if you're starting from the beginning, you're taking over a team in the off season. So you have to prepare and go through the draft. So for hockey specifically, its draft is held every summer because you generally play in the fall and winter. So you would start the game and you would, like you're saying, go through data from real players that are young, that currently exist in the world but haven't been drafted yet you can you can scout them you send scouts to them you get all this data and analytics that you go through and you have to make choices and the game is so good at simulating sometimes a sure bet is just terrible you draft a player and they're just awful and they've done such a good job with each avatar that every single player regardless of how skilled you are, can do or not do certain things. So there is the authenticity of when you're building a team, it does matter the type of player that you scout. It matters the type of player you trade for. It matters what types of players you have on your team because if you don't have a balanced, well-put-together team, you're going to find yourself unable to do certain things. And that's, to me, where the simulation becomes great. You start in the off season, you prepare for the draft, you have to send your scouts around the world to somewhere between, for hockey, it's somewhere between 9 and 12 leagues that you have to scout. So you have a certain budget to hire a certain amount of scouts that you have to assign to a certain amount of regions and tell them what you're looking for, what types of players you're looking for, what types of skill sets you're looking for, and they will scout them. And depending upon how good the scout is, which depends upon how much money you've spent on them, that depends on how accurate it is. Then you draft all of these players, and then you have to develop them. You have to send them into a training camp. Do you send them back to juniors? Do you send them to your farm team system? You're operating, like if I'm the Toronto Maple Leafs, I have my own farm team and my regular team. So I'm operating two teams and the careers of 70-plus individuals that I'm trying to find places for. And then you get into the regular season, you play through just like you would. You play games, you see how it goes, you can make trades if you want to, and then you get into the playoffs, and if all your hard work pays off, you have a good playoff, you get to the end of the regular season, and it starts all over again. And it follows very closely the timeline. You were talking about that game of how you had like, oh, you have an inbox, and you have, it's the same thing. 
you have an email, you have access to information, you're, you're, the computer is simulating other general managers communicating with you at certain times. The trade deadline in hockey is so massive. Any sports fans will know that there's a certain date in each calendar year that you cannot make trades after. Um, it's just to make things fair leading into the playoffs. So that day in the game is this massive countdown from 8 a.m. in game time all the way to sort of around noon is when the deadline is and you have that amount of time with the pressure of making deals and at the same time other deals from other teams are popping up your competitors are getting stronger and you have to decide okay do i care or do you know do i just move forward with my team or do i make deals based upon what other people are doing so i find it pretty accurate to what you would go through and that kind of goes back to i've actually learned things that's helped me in other areas of my life from these games so i do think that there's a certain level of accuracy to it i'm not saying i could be a general manager of a hockey team let me just be very clear to you about that i'm not saying that i could well it's it's interesting right so what we're talking about reminds me a little bit of the film moneyball um, from, I guess this was in the mid-2000s, I think, when this film came out, um, about, no, it was in the mid-2000s when the Boston Red Sox won the World Series based on the philosophy uh, that is espoused in this movie, um, where uh, baseball was run prior on instinct, on intuition, on gut feeling, and then they used data to drive how they would run a team, and the Oakland Athletics uh, used this and had an amazing season, one of the longest, I think they tied for the longest streak in, in baseball history. Um, anyways, um, a fascinating story, but in the movie, Brad Pitt plays the general manager of the team, and it does not look like a very a fun job, and it doesn't look like, and I think the filmmakers go to lengths to show you that this is not a celebrity job like we often think that it is it's not even that well paid like there's financial pressures or it's at least alluded to that there are financial pressures on brad pitt's character in the film um and so you're thinking that you know the celebrities are the players and the coaches and even then those guys aren't always well paid some of them are really struggling because they're not at the top of the league they're not at the top of their game um, they're just not the elite players that we think of making 10 million dollars a year or something like that um so it doesn't seem like a sexy position to have in the world so i wonder why would you know if that's true you're doing what it sounds like to me in playing these games the unsexy work as well right you're you're doing the hard difficult work of sending out scouts analyzing data um going through a career and making tough decisions based on analyzing numbers why is that interesting and i i think you've kind of explained it but like you know, how would you convince someone like me who doesn't play games like this that this is actually fun? Well, <laughs> I think <laughs> I think it's a personality type too, right? Like I think what you're p putting on is is it's also what I sort of chose to do with my life. Like who who would at the age of 19 start a theater company and run it for 11 years? Like what that that was not fun. That it, it just it wasn't like it, the, I I can look back on a lot of things fondly about it. And I'm sure, I, I mean, I learned a lot and I wouldn't have changed a minute of it, but it wasn't fun or sexy or anything. Like I, like you should have seen me at the end of it. Like I was, I was 40 pounds heavier and just like done, <laughs> right? Like that's not, it's just, it sucks the life out of you, but there's something thrilling about winning and not being fired because the things that you're talking about of, of all these things I'm doing, the things I've, I haven't even gotten into are you're also balancing a budget in the game. You have to decide how much you want to spend on marketing because you also have to bring in people to see the games. And some of that's based upon how well the team does, and some of it's based upon who you decide to market. What player are you going to promote? Are they popular? Are you going to try to make them popular? How much money are you going to spend on marketing? Are you going to do giveaway nights for bobbleheads? Are they popular? How are you going to get kids to go to the games and build the next generation of fans? All that's in there. And it's fascinating to me because there's a risk to it. And it's a risk in a way that is a little bit more palatable than the risk of life of being fired by something. So there's one great story that I always tell people about these games. I got a, a new hockey game. I've, I've, I've bought the new hockey game every year since I can remember. 
I've always had the new latest hockey game. I got one of them. I was really excited. They had just upgraded the general manager and franchise mode. So I played. This was the first time you were on contracts. So I thought, I have no idea what happens at the end of my own contract. Three years, seasons go by. My team never made the playoffs. We did okay. Like we improved each year, but couldn't make the playoffs. It was really rough. Things were not going working well. I was banging my head against the wall trying to figure out why. I got fired in the game from the team. I've never seen that happen before. I was fired as the general manager and the game turned off. Wow, interesting. So I had to load the game back. I had to come back into it and basically, okay, now you're a free agent. Another team could offer you a contract, but you can't play with that team anymore because you got fired. Interesting. So there's stakes, but it's not, I think there's something within me that I love it and I can get as excited about it as real life. But I know at the end of the day, it's okay if the game fires me and it turns off because I can always start again or I can always do a new team, but there's, I, I'm not going to lose my house because I got fired from that. So I think that there, there's a way to do these things that I enjoy in life that I, that I do get a thrill out of work and that I do get a thrill out of life as a, why would anyone become a CEO? Why would anyone become a, a, their own business owner? Why would anybody drop everything and, and start a new adventure, right? Like you're doing. Well, it's because there's a thrill and a passion there. And I think this is a safe way to do that passion and do that thrill and still get excited because frankly there's stakes because you can get fired but it's also like well it's not the end of the world because it's a game mike that was a great answer and i gotta say at the beginning of your answer i was skeptical because you were going off about an 11 year period where you gained 40 pounds and were not happy and it wasn't and you stressed it wasn't fun it wasn't fun and then i'm like okay i asked you to sell me something here and, but then you did. So so good work on that. Oh, you got it. You got to build you down, Ben, and then back up. That's my sales trick. I got to break you down, get you so, and then no matter what I say next, it's got to be good. No, that, it worked. It was effective. I, I kind of want to play EA sports games now, even though, uh, you know, there's there's some bad blood out there about EA. Uh, they, they, they don't have the best reputation in the world, but I'm glad that they make good sports games. Um, quick question. We're going to move into the rapid fire questions in a second, but... Um, do these games have, um, do they make you pay for small things here and there? Or is it you pay an amount, you get the game, and you have it forever? Like, are there microtransactions and little things like that? In some game modes, there are. Um, in the franchise modes and the GM modes and the things that we're talking about, there are not. Um, you don't have to spend another dime. Now, most of the games now have an online version as well. So there is an online aspect where you can basically purchase gear and other things to like help your avatar to like build your character up or to find things that will help you in the online gaming i'm i'm not super into that kind of thing i will play online with friends in order to see how our teams match up in order to play in order to communicate it's a great way to stay in touch with people but in most of the game modes that i play you still don't have a lot of microtransactions beyond you buy the game you've got it and you're good to go um it sounds to me, ask, answer me a question here about these games. Can you play online but not necessarily play at the same time? Like I play in the morning, you play that evening, and, and our teams play against each other in the off time? Or is it you got to be online at the same time? You'd have to be online at the same time in order to play each other. Which So I've got uh, two close friends of mine who played various sports games and were a far distance apart. That will be our, our way of connecting every two weeks. We'll get together, we'll play a game, we'll talk on a headset, and we'll play. But you do have to be live, um, especially with sports. Most of the sports games that, that we play, there you have to be live in order to see things. You can't like make a couple moves and then hours later, someone else makes a couple moves and you could continue a long game. You've got to be there to play your periods, your match, whatever. I play basketball with one friend, football with another. You have to kind of be present in order to, to see that. Okay, that makes sense. Um, okay. Um, oh, yeah, right before we move into the rapid fire round, quickly, what are the other games that you played? You mentioned fantasy. So what are some other games that you've dipped into over the last five years? Uh, another really good friend of mine plays Diablo. So she got me into that because that's our way of communicating and talking kind of on a weekly basis. Um, so we'll get together once or twice a week and play Diablo for a couple hours, build characters out of that. I wasn't familiar with the game at all until she introduced me to it a couple years ago, and we've been playing ever since. Um, gaming, for me, became so much more about 
connecting to people than it was before because I always used board games and, and physical interaction to, to do that. But even before the pandemic, as friends move away and you get older, this sort of online gaming, I, I dipped into games because a friend was like, oh, I have this game. I know you have a, you know, you have a PlayStation 4. I have a PlayStation 4. I have this game. Do you have it? And I would just go buy it. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I have it. I'll just go buy it. And then this way we can play and then I can connect and keep the friendship going. So Diablo is a big one. Um, you know, and most people who know me know I'm a huge Star Trek fan. So I started to get into a couple Star Trek games. Um, there's Star Trek Bridge Commander, which is one that I'm pretty much into because you take control of a bridge and can order people around and go on missions and have to complete them, um, which is is a pretty cool as well. Um, and then I used to be, I still have my computer, but I don't play them as much. I used to be huge into certain PC games. Um, and a lot of those were like sort of similar to Command and Conquer, but more um, like strategy games in the sci-fi or fantasy world. So there was two or three Star Trek ones where you're building, you're building your star base. You've got to build up your, your entities and go off and battle in a certain map and protect your assets while you also attack um, those types of games as well. Cool. Um, Mike, there's a really, I don't know if you've heard of this game called Stellaris. I have it. Okay. It's a, essentially a space 4X a game, like explore, exterminate, conquer, you know, like civilization, but in space. Uh, but it's uh, uh, released in 2016. It's continually updated from Paradox. I think you'd enjoy it, especially because there's a mod that reskins the whole game in Star Trek. Oh. So that essentially it's Stellaris, but in the Star Trek universe. And I, I've heard great things about that mod, and I think you might uh, enjoy the game. I will look into it. It's um, it's one of the things Star Trek has been missing, because they did this game, it was, it was, um the Star Trek games that were similar to kind of like basically playing Risk or Command and Conquer, but in Star Trek, but they were missing what civilization does really well. They they never really found that. So if there's a mode that will change it to look Star Trek, I will I will definitely look that game up. Well, and I think it doesn't just change it to look like Star Trek. It changes the mechanics to be like Star Trek. Um, and one great thing about Stellaris that I think you'd, you'd really appreciate is it's a management simulator, like you're managing an empire. And the same skills that you bring to, to the fore with managing a hockey team, for example, are going to help you in Stellaris. So, yeah, just a recommendation. Um, okay, rapid fire round. Um, how often do you play? Every week, every month, whatever. Um, I would say that I play somewhere between seven or eight sessions a month, which usually are about an hour to two hours long. So maybe 14, 15 hours a month. And that's when I'm busy. In the winter, when things slow down for me, I that will increase where I'll play more consistently on a weekly basis. Are games addictive for you? And if they are, is, is it a problematic addiction or a fun addiction? No, games are not addicted for me. Um, nothing is. I, I don't know if I can become addicted to anything, Ben. I have to be honest. Uh, I've never felt a pull to, to must do something. So no, there's no addiction there for sure. Okay. Uh, should you or do you wish you could play more games or less games? I would say more um, only because I'm, I'm missing some of the elements of a stress release that it, I think it used to give me. And because I'm so busy, I don't get to play quite as much as I would want to. And it really does do a lot of help for me. Like, it really helps my mental health. It helps me relieve stress. So I think I wish I could play a little bit more. Has a game ever made you laugh? Yes. Plenty of times. Like why? What's made you laugh? Like I guess a ridiculous thing happening in a sports game. Or? Yeah, ridiculous thing happening in, in a sports game. A ridiculous catch that shouldn't have been made. A penalty that was missed. Um, I've also played a couple. I guess like open world games where the story would get ridiculous and I would start laughing. Like I've never been into like Grand Theft Auto and that type of thing, but I've played and tried them because everybody is into certain games. And sometimes things will happen and I just laugh at the ridiculousness of the writing. Has a game ever made you cry? No. Has a game ever made you quit in frustration? Yes. When I, when I did get fired from, from that game, which never happened for the first time, I was quite angry. Um, and I stopped for a while. Has a game ever made you decide to change your life? In a way, yes. Do you want to elaborate or just leave it at that? No, I mean, I guess, I guess most of the things that I learned from these games that I kind of alluded to was the, the how to manage a budget 
properly. And I actually have taken skill sets from that I've used in the game and applied it to life. And honestly, I don't think I would have been able to manage a theater company for over 10 years without the experience of those games. So in a way, it, it gave me the confidence to know, oh, I've seen budgets exactly like this before. I can fill it out for grants. This is exactly what I've been gaming with since I was seven. So I understood and kind of got it. So I don't know if it definitely a game was like, okay, I'm going to now go do this. But I think it gave me confidence that helped me be successful early when maybe I shouldn't have even been successful at what I was doing. That's actually one of my questions about, like, have games taught you anything? And I think you've got a clear, pretty clear answer to that. Um, do, do you prefer games that ask you to imagine something? Or when you typically play, are you using the game as a springboard to imagine things? Or is most of what you're imagining, seeing, feeling happening in front of you on the screen? I do think I like games that ask me to imagine things. Because I think that there's an element of when you're not gaming, it's fun to be to spend time thinking about the game and to be dissecting certain things. Um, even in sports games, when a trade doesn't happen, the game still makes you imagine, like, why? Why did that not work? What would I have to do in order to make that trade more appealing so I can leave the game, you know, I can eat, have a shower, think to myself, come up with a plan and come back, right? And that's... That, to me, I think I like about games. I like that they make you think and imagine and, and try to perceive things that might not be right in front of you. Does a game usually for you wind you up or wind you down? Does it, is it action-based and getting you good to go? Is it, is it um, bringing your adrenaline up, you're, you're increasing your heart rate? Or is it a relaxing, chilled out, more patient experience where you're not letting things happen, you're still active, but where you, it's meant to kind of chill you out a bit? Yeah, I would say chilled out, relaxed, unless I'm playing with another human being. And then it's the exact opposite because I get competitive and it's fun to be competitive at something that at the end of the day doesn't matter that much, but it's fun to get competitive with with friends and to to kind of give each other a hard time. So yeah, I would say if I'm gaming by myself, it winds me down. It's the perfect way to end an evening. If I'm with somebody else or I'm gaming online, it the adrenaline goes through the roof. How important are aesthetics to you in the games you play? Extremely. I want to feel. I want it to feel as real as possible. Absolutely. It's interesting because so much of what you're doing is is management. But but you know a a, a real looking budget and spreadsheet is super exciting to me, Ben. A real looking marketing <laughs> plan is super exciting to when I'm building that arena and making color choices. I want to see the colors pop. Right. And all that stuff. And it's the same. Like when you go into the game mode, when you're in management mode and you finally decide to play a game after hours and hours of doing other things, and then you finally play a hockey game, I want it to feel real. I want all the work I put in. I want decisions I'm making in the game to be reflected in my gaming experience. So when I'm playing and I've got my controller and I'm ready to play and push all the buttons and do all the things, I want to see the players that I acquired. And if he has a broken nose, I want to see something like I want to see it. And that, that's what I like about it. the real experiences. So this player has an injury, then I want to see him limp. You know, this, the, your sales aren't going well, then I don't want to see people in the crowd. I want you to reflect exactly what all my decisions are doing, and I want to see it. Okay, no, that's great. Um, last two questions. What is the, if you can think of it, the most disappointing game you've ever played? Disappointing game I've ever played? it's you know there's there have been disappointing ones because i mean these ea sports produces a new football hockey baseball etc game every single year and some of their versions suck um so there's definitely been a couple years i think nhl 17 and 18 were back-to-back -back duds where they barely made any changes and improvements it was starting to get stale it was behind the times and then finally they came back with nhl 19 and it was like okay here we go we're off to the races but i do remember spending 75 dollars on this brand new game and being super disappointed that it wasn't much different than the version i already had okay last question if you had to pick one game that you were stuck with to play till the end of time what would that one game be probably the latest nhl game so i mean right now it's it's i've got 22 but i will be purchasing 23 like it's whatever the latest nhl game is because i think hockey for me 
I, I know and understand the management side way more than any other sport. So if I could sit down playing EA Sports NHL 23 or 22 and just have the one game, endless amounts of entertainment. Because if I just want to be a general manager, I don't have to play the games. I can just do that side of it. If I just want to play the games, I can just play the games. If I just want to be a coach, I can be a coach. Like There's four or five or six different experiences where the gaming can be endless in terms of the amount of different types of games you can play when you get in there. So yeah, it would probably be the latest, whatever the latest NHL game is, if I had to just pick one, that would be it. Okay, Mike, this was really interesting. Not only very informative, but you know, I had fun. Unlike the 11 years of your, of your life that was spent, uh, by the sounds of it, having no fun gaining weight, in the in the gutter listen ben it was terrible like i i i will not trade it for a minute i would never trade a moment of it for anything else but i can't sit here and tell you that that was a great 11 years like it was so rough it i I learned a lot i grew up a lot made a lot of mistakes made a lot of enemies made a lot of friends it doesn't matter overall i wouldn't wish that on anyone i would do it again in a heartbeat yeah, maybe I'd have the same feeling about franchise hockey manager eight. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you if if you were in a scenario where you really got into it, I bet you you would, because I think Ben, you're that personality type. I think you would yeah. go back to something no matter how much because if you loved it and you got passion out of it, you would go for it. And that was for me running a theater company and running a fake hockey team, those are the things that, that kind of get me get me going every day. Like, those are the things that get me really excited, and I think it's a personality type. I think you have it, too. Okay, Mike. uh, Is there a a way that people can find out about what you're doing? What are you doing? What are you up to these days, and how can people connect with you? If you want them to, you you may not be interested. (laughs) Sure. I mean, yeah. um, You can find me on Twitter or Instagram if you want. I may not let you follow me, depending upon who you are. Um, But I'm my own Mike on all platforms that's usually you can find me my own mic um but i'm i'm running uh i'm doing a lot of cool different projects actually right now i run social media for a bunch of small businesses i'm the uh, marketing and man uh, sort of marketing manager and development manager for a theater company that tours across ontario so i'm doing a lot of cool things i um that's kind of like the main stuff i have a podcast for movies because i'm a movie lover you can look that up screening in kingston is what it's called because i'm you know from the kingston area but it just talks about movies anywhere you don't have to live in Kingston. Um, but those are ways that you can connect with me if you really, really want to. Um, but otherwise, I'm going to continue to uh, listen to your stuff, Ben, and be right here for all your weekly videos. So everyone else should just do that. Check out your weekly videos because they're awesome. Okay, thanks, Mike. This was great. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you.